where there's muskegon walleye Hi everybody, this is Jeff Adams from the Icebox Radio Theater, uh, coming on to let you know about a very special dedication. We lost a close friend in the past year, Myron Howerlick, who was a singer, a songwriter, a collaborator. He played piano with us on many a live show, and as a matter of fact, wrote our theme song that you're listening to right now, is sadly no longer with us. And we'd like to dedicate this season of Mystery on the Air 2018 and 19 to him. Myron, I know the Heavenly Band sounds quite a bit better now with you in it, but we still miss you very, very much. Thank you for all you've done, and this season is for you. But the Icebox Radio Theater is on the air. From International Falls, Minnesota, it's my favorite. Good evening. I am Dr. Graves. Welcome to... Mystery on the Air. Good evening, and welcome to Mystery on the Air. The premiere broadcast of this new series from the Icebox Radio Theater. I am your host, Dr. Graves. Welcome to the end of the world. How will this world end, I wonder? In a flash of light? In a blast of sulfur? In the jarring shake of an earthquake? There is one man of letters who thought a great deal about the end of the world about our puny planet being absorbed into dimensions beyond space, or conquered by gods from distant stars. In one memorable story, this writer saw the end coming not with a flash of light or monstrous creatures, but with a sound. Not a horrible sound, he wrote, but an exquisitely low and infinitely distant musical note suggesting a player in one of the neighboring houses. Prick up your ears, dear listener, and be still. The end of the world is coming, and the only thing that stands between us and oblivion is the music of Eric Zahn, based on a story by H.P. Lovecraft. look for a seal street anymore. I still see it in my mind, though. I see it as it was that last evening. Sidewalks cracked and broken. Streets empty except for potholes and the brick tenements so dilapidated and crooked. They only seem to stay upright by leaning against each other. I don't look for a seal street anymore because its strange poverty-ridden appearance is burned into my memory, my memory of that last night, the night I heard the music for the final time. You ought to stop to think that if you're driving at today's top speed of 35 miles an hour and a blowout swerves your car into an oncoming truck, which oh, travels at the Jesus. same speed, the resulting crash has a force of 70 miles an hour. 
Oh my god! You wanted to see me, Howard? Get in here and close that damn door. What's got you in a mood? Well, this. You don't like the new Springfield tire spot? Oh no. I love it. Death and gore on the highways. Perhaps we just should describe what happens to the human body when an engine slams into it. Sure, a lot of boys who came back from the war will appreciate that. What the hell were you thinking? Look, it's Keaton. You know what he's like. Safety is all he wants to feature in his spots. And he thinks we need the blood and guts to wake people up. Cancel him. Smoke? No, thank you. And we can't cancel Springfield. They're our last national client. Yeah. What's really wrong with you? What? What do you mean? We've been running that spot for weeks, and it's never bothered you before. (sighs) Two more today. Two? Who? Chelmsford and Ann Arbor. Both going with NBC. I see. Are you going to make an announcement this time? Hell no! And you're going to keep your pretty little trap shut, too. Howard! Well, look, last time I announced that we lost the station, it turned into a psycho ward out there. The staff have a right to know. You think they don't know? They all know this network is dying, Helen. They don't need to know the particulars. Anyone with half a brain in the office is already looking for another job. You should be, too. It's different for me. You know that. Yeah. Captain goes down with her ship, huh? I'm not the captain. That would be you. Ship owner's daughter, then. <laughs> Trying to bring this network back from the dead won't... Oh. Uh, gee, I- I'm sorry. Bring my father back from the dead? I apologize. I wasn't thinking. Don't worry about it. I'm well aware I can't save the network, Howard. Yeah, well... Maybe if that thing in Little Rock comes through, we can gain a few stations in the South and... and no and one then, in the uh... South is going to listen to a New England network, and the stations know it. I don't want to save CRN. I just want its last few months... Maybe weeks. Then weeks! To have a little dignity. We don't have the money of the big boys. We're not moving into television with them. But that doesn't mean we can't have a little class. Does it? Why is it whenever you start talking about class and dignity, I feel like I'm going to lose mine? You'll like this idea. (laughs) Sure, sister. (laughs) Only that's what you said about the last three ideas. You put me in charge of sustaining programming. What did you expect, the Jason Sanborn hour? I'm fresh out of dummies, Howard. Fine. Just put me out of my misery. You sure? Hit me. All right. Did you know that Eric is a composer? Eric who? Our Eric, the violinist in our orchestra. You mean the violinist that is our orchestra? What about him? He's a composer. He writes music. Right. Right. Yeah, and I've got a half a screenplay in the bottom of my drawer. Oh, really? Right under the bourbon. What's your point? I think we should give Eric a half an hour. It will be good for the station. Give us a certain air of class. And I've heard Eric's work. It's good. He's one of those modern composers. How exactly is Broken Down Eric supposed to give us an air of class? Pete's agreed to MC, and he already sounds like the Metropolitan Opera. Eric doesn't talk at all, so between Pete's narration and Eric's playing, we can't lose. Yeah, I... I don't know. Nothing major, you understand, but maybe a Sunday morning after the church service? You know, Eric fled the Nazis, right? He lost his whole family in one of those camps. You don't need to do that. Do what? I was just... Bring up the war. You don't need to. I was going to say yes. There's no reason to sink your claws in. I I wasn't. Save it. Next Sunday, 1030. Bump Reverend Jim. If he squawks, just remind him that real pastors have actual churches. Thank you, Howard. And transcribed. I don't want Eric freezing up and embarrassing everybody. Eric wouldn't freeze up. Record it, Helen. That's an order. He's never had more than a few notes to play, and you want him to fill 30 minutes live? No. Transcribed or nothing. That's my decision. All right, Howard. Just as you say. It was a victory of sorts. CRN was dying. Dead, really. And Howard was right. We all knew it. 
We were the last regional radio network, the last holdout from the massive corporate monoliths CBS and NBC. My father had founded the Continental Radio Network. He wanted us to stand for something, for intelligence and taste. Maybe that's why we failed, I don't know. The bigger networks were moving into television, and we were moving into oblivion. But I was determined, on my father's grave, we would go there with our heads up, honoring his original vision. I think Howard would have gone along with that enthusiastically, but he had had a difficult time during the war. And after it. So it was up to me. I had to make sure the network went out with dignity. And since we couldn't afford Isaac Stern, dignity came in the form of our very own house violinist, Eric Zahn. Eric was a charity case of my father's. Dad had sponsored Eric's immigration in the early years of the war, when they were still allowing Jews to leave Germany. And he had practically lived at the station ever since. He was a small, lean, bent person, with shabby clothes, blue eyes, a satyr-like face you could call grotesque, and a nearly bald head. Though not a great violinist anymore, he was still very, very good. And he worked cheap, playing intermissions for our radio plays and interstitial pieces, the tiny pieces of music that cover dead air. He lived in one of those shabby tenements on Osseal Street, the very top floor. One night I went to visit him there and was surprised at the beautiful view from his window. The city lights of Providence were spread out before us as he played. That was beautiful, Eric. Good, good. For reasons I was never told, Eric could not speak. He sounded somewhat like a deaf mute, though he could hear perfectly. I imagine it must have had something to do with what happened during the war. He communicated by means of a chalk slate. <laughs> I never said Mozart was better than Beethoven. I said his playing probably was. Didn't you say Mozart was better on the piano? Uh, yeah. I'll be that as it may. We'll never know. We have the music, but no recordings. Beethoven could have been terrible for all we know. <laughs> yes, unlikely. Yeah. What's that? Uh, why did you... You mean me, of course. Why, why did I want to come up here? Do I need a reason to visit a good friend? Well, that's true. This visit is long overdue. <laughs> yes, something is on my mind. There's something I wanted to ask you. Eric, uh, Howard has agreed to giving you a show. Half an hour, this Sunday. Just you and your violin. With Pete doing introductions. Uh. What did I... Uh, I, I, I want to ask if you do it, of course. Uh. There are better players. Not for me, there isn't. Besides, it would be good for the network. To show off our in-house talent. Let people see the quality we bring. Sure, CBS has been Crosby, but we have Eric Zahn and his violin. Will you do it? Good. 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 Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I was nervous asking you. Well, because I know you're shy. <laughs> Oh, that's very sweet, Eric. It's it's getting late. I I should go. 
Could you come up with a preliminary list of pieces you want to play? I'd like to show it to Howard by tomorrow afternoon. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for the kuchen. That. Oh.、Uh, Are coming. It was very, very nice to hear you play. And that was the end of our very nice evening. The old tenement smelled of mildew, and I could hear people arguing through the paper thin wall. But the plum cake Eric served was fresh from the German bakery, and the rich black coffee he offered just about took my breath away. And his playing, the Mozart, the Brahms, the Beethoven, it was all beautiful, if slightly uninspired. At least, that's what I thought when I left Eric's apartment. What happened next changed everything. When I went out to the street to wait for my bus, there wasn't a soul around. There never seemed to be anyone on Osseal Street. Other than the wind, it was quiet. That's why I was able to hear what I heard. The bus stop was only half a block from Eric's building. I could easily stand there under the street light and hear the music. It was coming from his top floor apartment. It had to be. There was no way anyone else in this neighborhood could play that well. But what music it was! What music! It was not one of the old masters. It was modern, fresh, disturbing. I'd never heard anything like it. Even though I was far away, I could feel this music in my very core, like the air around me was vibrating to a tune I couldn't describe. And that was the thing about the music I heard coming from Eric's little apartment. It was beyond description. It was as if my mind could not grasp what I was hearing. If I had to, if I was forced to describe what I'd heard on the street that night, I would choose only two words: beautiful and terrifying. I was just about ready to turn and go back when my bus arrived. It was the last one of the night. I lived cross town, so I had no choice. I had no choice. The next morning, there was an envelope waiting for me at my desk. It was Eric's list, the pieces he wanted to play for the broadcast. All classics, nothing I hadn't heard a hundred times from a hundred different players, nothing I didn't recognize, and that meant there was something missing. And we're out. Five minutes back. Hey, Harry. Hi, Helen. For what do we owe this visit from on high? There's no on high, Harry. This is a one-story building. Very funny. What can I do you for, boss? You need Eric right away.、Uh, not for half an hour. Tell me, does he always just stay in that booth when there's nothing else to do? You know, I asked him that once. Know what he said? What? He said sometimes he's paid to play, sometimes he's paid to wait. Right now, Eric's waiting. Yeah. Give me the high sign if I go long. Sure thing. Hello, Eric. I got your list.、Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you uh, uh, do you do you have your good? You have your slate. Um,、uh, I wanted to ask you a question about your playlist. Eh?、Uh? I, I like everything that's on it, but I was wondering if you would consider、uh, playing something a little bit more modern. Uh. Well, like, well, I don't know. What do you like that's modern? <laughs> Nothing. Very funny. 
And not really true, right? You know what I mean. Mm. Eric, last night at your apartment, I heard something. No, no, not Brahms. No classical composer. It was very modern, uh, very discordant. It was hard to listen to, but exciting. It wasn't when I was there. It was afterward. I was outside waiting for the bus, and I heard music. What do you mean it wasn't you? Is there another violinist living in your building? I read it the first time. It was you, Eric. I know it was you. That music was beautiful. And I want you to include it in our program. No. 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 Why why not? It's a little unconventional. I know, but... Yes, you do, Eric. Don't lie to me. Don't lie. Look, people will like the music. Don't even worry about that. We need something different to make this show stand out. And I think that piece will do it. Not my music. Well, all right. Uh, We'll credit the composer. Maybe we can even come up with the small royalties. Uh, How would that be? Uh, Do you know the composer? Is it a friend of yours? It's my music. I heard you the first time, Eric. But I know what I heard. I heard you the first time, Eric. No! Eric! You're slate. Eric, what's wrong? What? What? Okay, okay, I'll get out of your way. Music. Mystery on the air will return. It can be in the sound of the orchestra preparing, or in the sound of a sculptor working in stone. Or even in the sound of laughter from inside a theater. It is the sound of art being created. And for over three decades, the sound of art being created has rung loud and clear in northeastern Minnesota. The Arrowhead Regional Arts Council has been encouraging local arts development in northeastern Minnesota through grants and services for over 35 years. Every year, they give out more than half a million dollars to local artists and arts organizations. And that helps create $40 million in revenue and jobs created. To find out more about our arts programs or how you can get involved, visit aracouncil.org. The Arrowhead Regional Arts Council. Where the arts flourish, you thrive. We now return to Mystery on the Air. And he stormed out. The kindest, gentlest old man I'd ever known stormed out of that studio in a fury. Harry the engineer was as surprised as I was, watching this sweet old character slam doors and knock things off shelves. I did the only thing I could think to do. I picked up his chalk slate, the tiny blackboard he used to communicate, and tried to figure a way to put it back together. It was in pieces. Howie, you got a minute? Minutes, hours, you name it. Have you been drinking? Something you need, Mother? Well, you could pour a girl a drink. There you go. I was kidding. Shame. Howard, what's wrong? No, you first. What? Came in here for a reason, right? You didn't just sense I was drinking in the afternoon, did you? 
I didn't think Nags had that ability. Fine, it's about Eric. What's wrong with Eric? Wait, is this about your little concert? Yes. What's that crowd done now? Please don't call him that. He's Jewish. He escaped from the Nazis. <laughs> so he says. A lot of Germans escaped, you know? They all claim to be Jewish or Austrian or some such crap to escape a firing squad. Howard. Cowards. You know my unit liberated one of those camps? One of the camps they showed in Life magazine? You ever seen someone who's been starving so long you can't feed them? It's true. These people, these... The women, these... People had starved for so long that if you just give them food, they'd die. They'd eat too fast, and they'd swell up, and they'd die. I had to give them this thin gruel for the first week, feed them with a spoon like babies. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know. Oh, hell. <laughs> I'm sorry, too. I should put a sign on the door. Manager drinking. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. I'll come back. No, no, no. What's little Eric done that's got your panties in a twist? There's a piece of music I want to include in the program, but he refuses to play it. Why? I don't know. But when I tried to talk to him about it, he got angry. Furious, really. Did he hurt you? If he hurt you, I, I swear to God. Oh, no, no, of course not. He stormed out of the studio. I've never seen him that upset. That doesn't. Doesn't sound like him. Harry was there. He can tell you. Oh, uh, well, okay. What do you want me to do about it? If you could maybe just talk to him man to man. I, I don't like talking to him. That little chalkboard of his and the damn grunting. Howard. What is so special about this piece of music? Why not just let him play what he wants? All sounds the same anyway, that classical bunk. Not this music. This music was... Incredible. It was like nothing I'd ever heard. This music on our network, I'm telling you. Howard, it could be an, a whole new start for us. I know you don't think much of highbrows. Trust me, there's a lot of money there. We could form a network specifically for them. And then other people could find it. Classical music, great literature all going out over the airwaves. And then it wouldn't matter if your family could afford to send you to the best schools. You could have something special. And it would be there for everyone. Huh. What? What is it? For a minute there, you sounded... Well, it was almost like I was talking to your dad. I think he would have wanted this. This could be the start of something. Well, it's not the start. It's the end. What? You haven't touched your drink, Helen. Howard, what do you mean, the end? I don't want to tell you here in the building. You want to go to lunch? It's after three. You want to go to dinner? Howard, please. I've heard from the board. They've called all the affiliates and they agreed unanimously. They're going to take NBC's offer. We go off the air Sunday at midnight. Does that mean... Uh... Sorry, not Sunday. Monday at midnight. Sunday will be our last full day. What happens to the studios? What happens to everyone? They'll get pink slips and their last checks. They can file for relief. As for the studios, the building practically belongs to the bank anyway. We've been running in the red for months, Helen. Then Eric's program is our swan song. I suppose it is. All right. I'll talk to him. Thank you. Helen? Yes? I'm sorry. I do not know what Howard said to Eric. I didn't want to know. It was probably a threat, possibly a lie, and definitely not in Eric's best interest. All I know is two hours later, Howard found me at my desk and told me a studio had been booked for the following day to record Eric's concert. An hour after that, a girl from the typing pool brought me an envelope. It was Eric's revised music list. The list was identical to the one I had received before, Brahms and Beethoven and the rest. Identical, except for one addition. The last piece listed was called Ossile Suite, Composer Unknown.
The day came. I went to the studio. Howard was there, looking stern and judgmental. Harry was at the board, carefully placing the 30-minute transcription disc onto the machine, making sure everything was ready. Pete, our best announcer, had come to work in a suit and tie, looking his best. I guess the news had gotten out, and everyone was a little down. We'd all be out of a job in two days. And this concert would be our last sustaining program, practically our last program, period. Then Eric arrived. He looked like a ghost. He was pale, his hair disheveled, his suit of massive wrinkles. And he smelled like he'd been drinking rot-gut whiskey. He marched past Howard and I without a glance. I looked at Howard, and he looked sheepishly back at me. I still didn't know what Howard had said to Eric to get him to add the mysterious music to the program. But looking at Howard's face, I got the idea he wasn't proud of what he'd done. But that was behind us now. It had to be. We had a show to do and a half an hour to do it in. All right, Helen? Yes. Eric, are you ready? Good. How about you, Pete? Well, I could use a glass of water. I'll run that in for you in just a moment. Let's get started. Harry? And we're at speed. All right, Harry, he's all yours. Cues to Pete. Ready in four, three, two. The Colonial Radio Network is proud to present a special program of violin music featuring our own virtuoso, Mr. Eric Zahn. Cue Eric. We begin our concert today with Bach as Maestro Zahn performs Partita No. 1 in B minor. It went well at first, better than I could have hoped. Eric played beautifully and with confidence, though there was a great sadness in his eyes. Howard leaned against the wall, gazing indifferently through the glass, but I was confident that would change once he heard the amazing disturbing music that would come. It was that time of the program. I was watching Eric through the control room glass. He'd grown paler since we'd begun recording. Ashen, almost. When he looked at me, I could not read what was in his eyes. I could not tell if it was sadness or anger or just... Resignation. And now, a piece that is, to the very best of our knowledge, a world premiere. Maestro Zahn now with the Osseal Suite, composer unknown. As the first notes escaped from the meeting of horsehair and wire, I felt a chill. It was not as if I was having goose flesh from hearing this beautiful music. It was as if the control room had grown colder. I looked down at Harry, who was in his shirt sleeves. I saw goose flesh on his arm. He reached over and rubbed it vigorously. What the hell? Is he, is he on the fritz again? The cold put me on edge but I couldn't stop listening to Eric pile notes on top one another. The music sounded angry, but Eric's eyes were lifeless and glazed over. His hands worked the bow and the fingering with robotic precision. He appeared to be unconscious, but he was playing beautifully. And then it was as if the very light in the room began to fade. Not like an electrical problem, but like the molecules of light could no longer reflect off of a solid surface. Eric played and played, and then played on. And as I listened, I became overcome with feelings I hadn't expected. I was overcome with feelings of horror. I looked at the men around the room. Pete was in his tiny isolation booth, staring at Eric, a look of revulsion on his face. Howard had turned away, he had a flask in his hand, and was drawing from it greedily. 
I did not know if Howard was disgusted with the music or with me for having caused this abomination. But we knew, somehow, all of us knew that this was wrong, that we should not be hearing this, that this music should not even exist. It was then that I turned back toward Eric and saw that the studio glass, the huge five by 10 sheet that protected the studio from the noise of the outside had grown cloudy and dark. It was almost opaque now. And then I realized there were things moving in the glass. There were shapes flowing in gentle circles and there were tiny pinpoints of light twinkling on and off. I could hear them, like low, angry rumbles in the distance. It was like I was looking through a telescope at some distant, cold, unholy corner of space that rumbled and belched its indifference out into the universe as it flowed ever outward. And Eric played on and on. Soon I could not see him through the glass. I could only see the stars and the planets what they were. I reached over and put my hand on Howard's shoulder. He wouldn't look at me. He faced away from the glass and shook his head vigorously like a frightened little child. My breath was short. My heartbeat hammered in my ears. Knowing this was all my fault, that I had to do something about it, I opened my mouth to order Harry to stop the recording. But before I could, the control room window shattered obliterating the images of space I thought I'd seen. The entire thing exploded into the studio. Not a single shard fell back into the control room. Pete, the announcer, was protected in his isolation booth, but he was knocked back. He stood up, his eyes were wide and red-rimmed by tears, and he pointed at the studio. Eric was gone. I thought Eric had been destroyed by the explosion. Then I saw the back door of the studio swinging loose on its hinges. Somehow, Eric had escaped. I turned and fled the building. I knew where he was. I ran as fast as I could toward Osseal Street. The traffic and the people grew less and less the closer I got. Until I was standing in front of Eric's building. The pavement around me deserted. The sky looked like it was about to open up. I ran into the building and up the stairs, up and up to the top floor. I came to Eric's apartment. Eric, it's Helen. Please open up, please. I'm sorry I didn't... I don't understand. I need you to explain. I need to talk to you. Hello? May I come in? Yeah, yes. Eric, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. I need to understand because... We were recording. We might still broadcast. I know, I know. I'm sorry. But you have to understand. The network is being sold. This concert... This was supposed to be our final broadcast. You were going to sign us off with dignity. That's why I need to know what that piece really was. Because it was terrible. But it was also amazing. But if people heard it, it would change music forever. They'd always remember hearing it. They'd always remember where they were when they heard it. Eric, what was that music? What's this? You're writing down the explanation. Eric, there must be 50 pages here already. On one of his sheets of paper, Eric wrote that he wanted me to sit. He motioned to a chair across the room. I settled into it as he took the wooden chair at his tiny writing desk near the window. His pencil flew across the paper. 
When he was done with one sheet, he threw it aside onto a loose pile of papers teetering on the edge of his desk. I almost thought of asking if I could start reading it right away, but I didn't want to disturb him. I should have, though. I should have asked. I I should have insisted. Then, at least, there might be some clue as to what was happening. As it is, we have nothing. I'd been in the chair for a little under an hour when we heard it. From out of the west, a sound. Unlike anything I'd ever heard, it seemed to originate in my very guts and radiate outward. Eric stood from his chair, staring out the window. He rushed across the room, picking up his violin. He walked to the window and stood resolutely in front of it. He looked like a wizard from a storybook. I could hear a great wind gaining momentum outside. And Eric began to play when suddenly... The windows exploded and tore down the curtains along with them, so that now the room was open to the elements. I looked outside in horror. The city was gone. I was confronted with the view of stars and planets, and the Bible-black infinity of space. And it all looked wrong. It all seemed to pulse and move in some unnatural dance to the profane rhythm of Eric's violin. Eric's manuscript flew up into the wind and was sucked out the open window. Eric seemed to teeter briefly at this development, then he half fell back into his chair, but he never stopped playing. He played and played and played in a fever, and I just stared, dumbstruck, at the impossible sights before me and the roar and the rumble kept coming closer and closer. I could feel the very air pulling me toward the open window and oblivion. Eric! Eric, we need to leave! We need to go now! I crossed in front of him and fell to my knees, imploring him to run. He just kept playing. And then I saw his face. It was cold and, and, and white like alabaster. His eyes were open, blue, and lifeless. God, his eyes. There was a thin film of ice covering them. I gently placed my hand on his chest, but rather than warmth, I was greeted with an appalling cold. Rather than a heartbeat, I felt nothing. And yet he played. Eric Zan, this living corpse, played on. Fingers and hands working of their own volition, And his arms flew out as if he'd been shot. And his body sagged in the chair. And his violin tumbled to the floor. And I did the only thing I could think to do. I ran. I made it out of the building and away from Osseal Street. With every block I ran, the strange sounds I'd heard faded out, and the city I knew slowly faded in. By and by, I came to an all-night diner and sat staring at a cup of coffee for hours. Finally, at around 3 a.m., I walked the direction I thought would lead me to Eric's apartment, but it didn't. I searched up and down the blocks, but I I couldn't find Osseal Street. It was as if it no longer existed. Later, when I continued my search and asked people, they all claimed they'd never heard of the place. They'd never heard of Osseal Street. By and by, I began to doubt my own memory. Had it existed? Had I imagined the whole thing? When we finally shuttered the doors at CRN, everyone scattered, not to New York or Hollywood, but to small stations, mostly out in the Midwest. Pete ended up a station manager in Ames, Iowa. Harry started a TV repair business that's doing quite well. As for Howard, I don't know. I'd like to hope he found peace somewhere, but 
I don't know. So many men that came back from the war never did. So I sit on a stool behind the counter at this record store, answering questions from old customers about Beethoven and Mozart, and questions from new customers about some gosh-awful thing called rock and roll. And I sort the stock, reading labels, hoping sometime to come across a copy of The Osseal Suite. Of course I never do. It's probably gone now, along with the street, and Eric, and all the rest. But during the nights when I choose not to sleep, lest I'm forced to confront the vision of the stars and planets in my dreams, I wonder about the sounds I heard. The sounds that seemed to come as a result of Eric's playing. Was he calling them, or was he keeping them at bay? And if it is that, if his music was a shield, a protection, what will happen to us? To all of us, if the sounds return, and there is no one here to play the music of Eric Zan. This has been Mystery on the Air, Episode 1, The Music of Eric Zahn, based loosely on the story by H.P. Lovecraft. Starring Tanya Milosevic as Helen, Jim Yunt as Phillips, Jeffrey Adams was Eric, and Justin Kapla played Harry the Engineer. Script, direction, and post-production by Jeffrey Adams. Some sound effects provided by the Freesound Project at freesound.org. The music of Eric Zahn, that is, the violin piece heard in this episode, was composed by Alex Voitenko of the Ukraine. Violin solo performance by Ulyerest Smurts, also of the Ukraine. This music was used by special arrangement with the composer. The end credit music was Despair and Triumph, by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 Mystery on the Air on the Icebox Radio Theater is made possible in part by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council thanks to appropriations from the Minnesota State Legislature's General and Arts and Cultural Heritage Funds (laughs) 